Good morning. Thank you for joining Virtual PBX uh, Dash Admin Training. Uh, you should be seeing on your screen here the Dash login page. This uh, is where you go, or this is at dash.virtualpbx.com. If you're on the Virtual PBX website, if you go under uh, support, uh, you'll see two sections, Dash support and the console support, and the Dash login link is there. And at this page, you enter in your username, which I guess I should make sure I can interact with this. So your username is your uh, email address, or that you're using with your user. password, and then your account name is your company name. And I didn't like that. That's Get rid of that, and we'll try that again. All right, sorry about that. So username is your email address, password is your password, uh, and then the account name is usually your company name, or it could be your name if you signed up for yourself. You can always hit keep remember me, or you can also click on the forgot info link if you forget your password. Once you get logged in, you get sent to the dashboard by default. Now, if you're a new sign up, the dash wizard comes up first, basically showing you some of the, like, here's your account information where you can adjust. Once you close out of that, you should be on the dashboard page. Uh, if you're not, you can use this up here, this icon here at the top right, the hamburger menu, and you can click on here and go to dashboard. Uh, down below, or we'll just go down the list here, this is for queues, so if you're making use of ACD queues, uh, this is essentially a call center feature. So basically you have agents logged into the queue, and these are people who are taking lots of calls, typically speaking, right, for a department, for like a tech support department, or uh, an information, like your operator, to, you know, who are then routing calls to other people. Blacklists, uh, this is a feature to allow you to block calls from coming into your account. Basically you get the caller ID of the number that you want to block, and you add it to the list. And then that, whenever that phone number tries to call your system, they just get a busy signal. Uh, as an admin, you can get to faxes on the account, any fax box. I think monitor is not currently active. Uh, recordings goes to your call recordings. The user portal, this is something every, uh, your standard users, this is what they normally see. And they can see their voicemails and their call history, et cetera. And you yourself, as, as an admin, can get to your own user portal. Uh, the voicemails, again, as an admin, you get to any voicemail box on the account. And then webhooks is if you're making use of APIs to link Dash into other software. All right. So on back on the main dashboard page, uh, you have your total users. This basically showing you how many people are you have as full-fledged users. These 
for every user on the account you're being charged for. So you don't want to be too uh, willy-nilly about who you're adding. Down below that, you have devices, and then broken down by type of device. Uh, and then unregistered devices, this is in relation to your VoIP phone. So a uh, physical VoIP phone, like a Yealink or Cisco, Polycom, et cetera, uh, your soft phone applications, as well as the web phone. And basically, unregistered means the system uh, is not detecting them as connected to us, so we can't send calls to it. Over here to the right, main numbers. You can have multiple main numbers on your account. Um, you could have one for every you know, state in the union or in different countries. On, all be your main numbers. Main numbers all behave uh, in the same fashion, meaning if you have a main number or a main greeting play associated with the main numbers, each number that you call will have that same main greeting play. And then they're all going to route the same way. And that's handled under our incoming call handling, which we'll get to shortly. Down below that, we have some graphics here showing your total numbers. All right. So first, we've got assigned numbers and spare numbers. An assigned number means it's a number in use, meaning it goes somewhere, it rings. Right, whether it's one of your main numbers or you have a number assigned to a specific user, going to a ring group, going to your ACD queue, what have you, if it's going somewhere to get to connect to someone, it's an assigned number. Right, your spare numbers; these are numbers that you do have on your account, but they're not going anywhere. Right, so they don't actually ring, but basically you're holding on to these numbers for a specific pur purpose or reason. Now, be bear in mind that even Though it's a spare number and it's not in use, you will be charged for it if you're over your account al allocation. Most accounts include between one to three phone numbers as part of their plan. So just something to be aware of. Down below that, we have the USDID and US toll-free breakdown. Uh, and if you have the international numbers, there would be another link there for international. And just so you know, hey, this is how many toll-free numbers you have, and this is how many local numbers you have. And then just below that, we have the company directory, and that's a download link as well. Uh, and these notice that there's only 10 listed there, or 10 users are listed, even though I have 20 total users. What that means is I've only set 10 users as to show up in the company directory, and the other 10 I have not. Now, that, you can always change that as an admin at any time. All right, the account ID, that long alphanumeric string, this is technically your account number. Uh, you can use that to tell us who you are if you, when you communicate with us. But in general, when you call in to support or to billing, for example, or you use chat to contact support or our sales team, we're just going to ask you for your company name, and we'll look you up that way. Um, but if you have multiple accounts, then you might want to include the account ID. The account realm, uh, used for a couple of different purposes. Uh, if you make use of outbound faxing, the account realm is part of that process. So essentially, to out send an outbound fax, you use email. Uh, and in the to field of that email, you put the plus one area code and phone number of where you're faxing to. You put the at symbol, and then you put that domain, the account realm as the domain for that email address, and then you attach a PDF or TIFF. The other thing the realm is used for is to program a third-party device, whether that's a software application like uh, XLite from Counterpath, for example, or a VoIP phone that doesn't show up under our auto-provisioning list. And then last at the bottom there is the store discount code. Just for being a customer of Virtual PBX, or a Dash customer of Virtual PBX, you get a discount when you're buying things through our web store. That includes wipe phones or a router, among other things. All right, up here at the top, we have the caller ID. This is your company caller ID. This is your default caller ID information. Uh, on a new account, the system will really want you to set this up. It'll be a little red flag. Um, you can use any of your main numbers. And then you've got the caller or the company caller ID name or C name. 
This is restricted to 15 characters. That includes any spaces or special characters. Once you click update or save, um, this gets transmitted to the various servers with various carriers who support CNAME. It takes roughly three to five business days for all those servers to get updated. A couple things to bear in mind with CNAME. First and foremost, not every carrier in North America supports CNAME. So if a call routes through one of those carriers, your CNAME information will not get through to your destination. Unfortunately, there's nothing we can do about that. It's those carriers chose not to support CNAME. Uh, even for the carriers who do support CNAME, it is their least priority. So if they're having, say, heavy call volume, for example, or there's some sort of maintenance issue or, you know, uh, like a telephone line went down, right, they're still going to try to route calls as best they can. Their first priority is always to connect the call. The second priority is the caller ID, the actual phone number that shows up. And then last, and definitely least as far as they're concerned, the CNAME information. So, say in the case of heavy call volume, so like we're gearing up for election season here in North America, you're going to have a lot more call volume in any given region. The carriers, you know, again, they're always going to try to send it all at first, but once the call volume gets high enough, they'll start dropping off the CNAME information just to make sure more calls can get through. All right. Down below that, we have the company E911 information or uh, emergency information. This is, again, the default for the account for anyone who has a VoIP phone. They pick up that phone called 911. This is the default address that gets sent to emergency services. So first and foremost, you want to make sure this address is correct because uh, you don't want someone to get go to the wrong address. right? Uh, and you can't set that for, by device so that if you have remote employees, they can have the correct E911 information. And as you can see here, this address here is in Las Vegas, whereas like virtual PBX were based in San Jose. Next up, we've got the hold music. This is a, the account default hold music. And you can upload your own file. Uh, Dash accepts both .wav, .wav, or .mp3 files. Uh, currently, you're restricted to one megabyte in size. You want to make sure that any file you upload to Dash is recorded in mono, not in stereo. Uh, and the main reason for that is when you listen to an audio file over the phone, you have one speaker. So if you have a stereo file trying to play over a phone, what you hear is a lot of static. Also, by having it in stereo, it's two audio streams, which means that you're increasing the amount of data, whereas if you had it in mono, you could have a longer hold file. Another thing to keep in mind about hold music on Dash is that this is after your staff members have picked up the phone, right? So a caller comes in, they go through your main greeting, and then they enter extension number, whatever, that whole time they're going to hear rings, right? The hold music comes into play when after, after your staff member has picked up and said, let me put you on hold. They press the hold on their web phone, and this is the default music that will play. And then you would click on Save Changes to save any changes. Then we'll go to Hours, which is part of our main number group of settings. All right, so by default, new accounts are set up as 24-hour open office meaning, hey, you're open for business and you're taking calls. However, most people end up wanting to do custom office hours. Let me move this over here a little bit. Here we go. Uh, for each day of the week that you're open, you just put a check mark. And then in the boxes over to the right, you choose your open hours in 24-hour time. and then at the bottom you would click on Save Changes. Uh, one thing to keep in mind here is that this bottom is, or at the bottom here is this option here. If your whole office uh, or store is closed for lunch, you can put a check mark here and then enter your lunch hours down below. All 
right, let's go into office holidays. You can set your office holidays in advance. You have single day, date range, and an advanced option. So single day, it's like this President's Day here, but February, but the date, you know, click save changes. Now, uh, and then for date range, we have this option here. Got December 29th through, or 22nd, excuse me, through 26th. Right, so you're close. You're basically your system knows, hey, I'm close to this whole entire date range. Now, because there's no year indication, that's why this one here is called Beware New Year's Eve to New Year's Day. You do not want to have a date range that includes New Year's Eve and a New Year's Day. Right, you would want to do those individually, and then extend it from beyond that or before that as necessary. And then for advanced, you can choose a month, for example, and choose, like, uh, why is this not selecting? Very strange. But, like, you can choose, like, in this case, the second Monday of March, we're just going to be closed. That's our company, you know, retreat. And, again, click on Save Changes. Incoming call handling. Oh, wait a minute. Sorry, I'm having some restriction issues with the streaming application I'm using. All right, so incoming call handling, this is basically how is your system dealing with calls that come in. And then in this case, we have open hours and holidays. If you're closed, you'd also have your closed hours tab as well. And if you're closed during lunch, you'd also have a lunch hours tab. And then you have these three basic options. So. First option here, call comes in, goes to the virtual receptionist. And you click on that, and that's a link. Uh, this is what most customers end up choosing. Basically, it's call comes in, you have a main greeting play, right? basically telling your customer what to press to get to whoever they want to speak to. right? One for sale, two for support. Or say, enter 801 to speak to Bob, 802 to speak to Mary, etc. All right, so over here on the left, we have your main menu. This is where you set up what the button presses do. All right, so in this case, we've set one to go to this Borderlands 3 info, and you get this little icon lets me know that this is a ring group. Uh, the, here, this looks like it is going to an ACDQ. It's got the little headset icon. This is one is going to the directory. This one's going to a voicemail box. You would click on Add a Route. Looks like we've got number five available. Oh, it's not going to let me do that on this. But basically, you can change your menu options by clicking here, and you'll have a pull down. Change the route, and then you can select this to say they go to a particular person. Over here on the right, you have your greeting options. text-to-speech, you just type it, you click update, and it's ready to go. Basically, it's a computerized or robotic voice. Uh, the advantage here is you can, it'll keep your, what you typed in place, and then if it doesn't sound right, or you're like, oh, I need to adjust that a little bit, you can just uh, edit this and then click update again. Upload your own file. You can record your own file, or greeting, I should say or you could have gotten to a professional services of some sort and upload. Again, .wave, .mp3, you want to make sure it's recorded in mono. If you've already uploaded files, oops, you would go from here, from, excuse me, uh, choose from existing files, and again, I'm dealing with the limitation here. Basically, you would see the list of everything you've already uploaded. You can record it over the phone. This uh, is designed to be used with a VoIP phone and for whatever uh, setting you're in. So right now we're just in open hours. So I would call in 
for my wait phone that's on the account. And if I've never set up a greeting at all, I can just uh, call in, enter this PIN number, and it'll walk me through it. Since I already have the text-to-speech greeting in place, again, I would call in, and as that text-to-speech greeting is going on, I would then enter the PIN number, and then the system would transition and say, hey, okay, let's walk you through setting up a greeting over the phone. Now, if you have your business hour set, for example, and you want to do your, your closed greeting, the system would need to be in, close, in, in that time where it's closed for you to call in, and it'd have a different PIN number. Then we've got professional recording services. Uh, if you click order, this will take you to a, another site. Uh, we've partnered with a company called Snap Recordings. They have something like a hundred different voice actors to choose from, and you've got options for various versions of English, as well as English, uh, Spanish, you know, bilingual readings as well, or Eng and English and French, I believe, as well. And then last year's settings, basically number of missed dials for your inbound customers. Basically, how many times can they hit the wrong button before the system says, okay, your call is done. Now, you notice here I've got this one here set as a default route. So if the person calls in and they make a mistake, right, then the system would then send them to this voicemail box by default. Um, because there's a lot of robot dialers out there nowadays, we don't typically recommend having a default route in place. So I would remove that. But then I would up your, your dialing repeats to like two. That's not letting me backspace at all. Well, I would set it to two, uh, at least, if not three. Okay. Um, so that way your your customer can hear their options, and in case you know someone's screaming in the background or whatever, they can at least have a second chance or a third chance to hear their options and hopefully press the, uh, a valid option. And the advantage of that and not having a default route is right. Someone's got to press a button to get to speak to you or leave a message. Robot dialers can't do that. So next option here, call comes in, and in this case I have it set to go to Cassie, and then go to virtual receptionist. Now, you've got other options, like I can send it to a queue, or the most common would be like a ring group, if I can scroll down far enough. There we go. So we'll call it my support group, right. So now that's a group of people who could answer this call. If they're not able to pick up, and that's basically the, the system offers it to the group for 20 seconds. Then it goes to a virtual reception so that inbound caller can then press the menu option, right? So basically, you want someone to have a chance to answer the call first, and if they're not able to, then your customer gets to spend, hit, click a menu option. And then this third option here, call comes in. Again, you can go, go to a user or a group. They're not able to pick up. Call goes right to voicemail. And then you click on Save Changes to make sure your save is take change, uh, changes take effect. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, any change you make in like the virtual receptionist, for example, so say we change it to Now, I save changes here, but you also want to save changes here, and that way all your changes for your virtual reception take effect. If you don't do that, that can cause an error. Um, you won't see an error, but basically when you try to call in, your system won't work properly. So make sure you save changes all the way through. This is your main fax box number. Basically, this is so you can receive inbound faxes, and you can edit the fax box here to include like who you're sending it to, uh, as well as uh, there's an SMT, 
HTTP permissions box, meaning if your company has their own email domain, you can add that email domain, so like at virtualfeedbacks.com, and that way anyone who's got your company email address can send a fax out. They don't have to be a user on your Dash account. They just have to have a valid email address with your company. All right, we'll go over to numbers. Okay, numbers in use is basically saying, hey, these are numbers that you're making use of in some fashion. And then your spare numbers that are just sitting on your account. You also have the option here to buy numbers, meaning add numbers to the account. So if you only have one number, but you want to end your account includes up to three, you would come here and you would click on buy. Say, we'll go local. We will enter 650 area code. And then we'll see what's in the available. You would click add and you would click on buy numbers. This would add it to your account. Now, as long as you're below that threshold, depending on what your account is set at, you're not actually being charged for it. Uh, but once you're over your phone number allotment, that's when you would be charged on your next invoice. Likewise, for toll-free, you choose one of the toll-free prefixes, and then the system will tell you what's available. You would click Add to move it over, and then Buy Numbers to add it to the account. Port is moving a phone number from one carrier to another. So in this case, it would be, say, from AT&T to Virtual PBX. And this would start that whole process. You would start a new port request, enter a name here, let us know if it's a toll-free or a local number, and then follow through on the steps. Basically, follow the on-screen in instructions. Um, unfortunately, every time I, I try to add or show an example, it shows up under numbers in use as one of these red numbers, and I haven't been able to get rid of them yet. I have to talk to my engineering team about that. Uh, so for porting a number, we need what's called a letter of agency, or LOA, that's available on our website. It's actually also available through that uh, porting process. There's a link to download the LOA. We need that filled out, basically your company name, or whatever the current carrier who has it, whatever they have it listed under. So if it's under you know, Bob Smith, then we need Bob Smith's name on the LOA, versus if it's ABC Dog Walkers, then we would need ABC Dog Walkers on the LOA. Uh, filled out, signed, and then you need to you can either submit through the Dash portal or you can email to porting at virtualpbx.com. If it is a local phone number, i.e. not a toll-free number, we're also going to need a recent copy of the bill in order to port. Uh, if it's a wireless phone number, i.e. you have a Verizon cell phone and you want to move, move that to your virtual PBX account, a couple things to keep in mind. First and foremost, when you port that Verizon cell phone number over to us or any cell phone number over to us, that cell phone will no longer have a phone number associated with it, which means that cell phone will not work once the port completes. So if you want to keep using that cell phone, you need to work with your current cell phone provider and make sure there's another number in place that you can then use so you can keep using your cell phone. The other thing about moving a cell phone over is uh, cell phone providers have an account PIN number. And that is basically to release the number so it can be ported out, which means you typically have to contact your carrier to get that account PIN and you want to include that on the LOA. So that way the porting process is smooth, right? If you try to port a number from a wireless carrier without a PIN number, it gets rejected, saying, hey, needs a PIN, we can't proceed. And that just ends up delaying the whole port process for you. All right, we'll go to users. So this shows all the users on the account. If you want to add a user, you would click on add user. You put their name, you put their email address, and you create a password. Uh, something to keep in mind is that each email address or each user has to have a unique email address, right? So if Bob and Mary just share the support at virtualpbx.com email address, well, they can't be two separate users on Dash, right? 
you have to put, you know, if Mary can be support at virtualbbx.com, Bob would be support one at virtualbbx.com. As far as Dash is concerned, those are two different email addresses. They can, ha they can be separate users. Whether or not that's a valid email address on your uh, email domain is a different question altogether. It's something we don't control. And then, you know, obviously create a password. Uh, main extension number. So Dash will default to the next available extension. Uh, I just went with the default on this account, which means when I first got in, I gave myself extension 1000, right? So therefore, everyone else I added after that was given the option or the system auto-filled, hey, number, you know, user number two is 1001 and then 1002, et cetera. So it's saying, hey, the next available extension in the 1000 series is, in this case, 1006. Now, I can change that if I want to and change it to, you know, 2006 or, you know, 4221, what have you. Here's your option to include in the company directory or not. And again, this isn't the only place. You have another option to do that later. Uh, send emails to an alternate address. This is in addition to the email address that you created or that you're using up here. So this is like, oh, I want to send it to Bob's personal email address as well. You can do that. And then the most important one you want to do is send credentials to the user, i.e., that the system will then send an email out to the email address up here. Well, and if you do the alternate, it also send it to them as well. Uh, but basically, it sends them, here's your username, here's your password, and here's the domain, so you can log in. And then you would click on Create User. Once they're created, you can click on their name here at any time. All right. So as an admin, you can always change the name. If you click on change credentials, you can change their, their credentials to log in. Voicemail box there. So when a user is created, they're automatically also created a voicemail box that's tied intrinsically with their user. Uh, basically, when, like, for instance, if you added a white phone to Bob here, then I could fit like a Yaling phone, for example. You'd have this voicemail box, and then their main extension number is set as the same number, essentially. Then their VoIP phone, their message lamp would light up if they have voicemail. So now, oh, I have a voicemail. I better go check on that. Right here, you got the checkbox to send an alternate address if you want to. And then here, you have the option to include in the user directory. On the right here, Bob's a user. It's a pull down here. You can change. You have the option to change them to uh, an admin if you want to. The main thing to be concerned about is if you're just signed up, first time logging in, you don't want to accidentally set yourself from an admin to a user. And then click save and then log out because then you don't have an admin on the account any longer. Which means basically you need to send us an email saying, hey, can you set me as an admin? Uh, time zone, this is your default time zone. And then this is your language. You can choose English, uh, French, or Russian. Ringing timeout, this is default at 20 seconds. Uh, you can set it higher, but basically this is how much time we tr by default that we will send a call to this user, meaning, you know, call comes in, they enter in uh, 1020, to get to Bob, and we're going to ring to Bob for 20 seconds. If he doesn't answer, then we're likely going to be going to his voicemail box. And then you can increase that, and then the main extension number, and then click on Save Changes. Uh, the extension box is basically assign an extension or you can add additional extensions to a particular user. The phone number box, this allows you to assign a phone number directly to a user. Basically, this number will go directly to this person. They don't have to go through their menu options, etc. Devices, 
this is where you would add devices to the to the user. Now, add from spare devices means you've already added them to the account in some fashion, and they're not already assigned to somebody. Or you can just choose a new device. All right. SIP phone. This means a VoIP phone. All right. Voice over internet protocol. We support auto provisioning with these uh, manufacturers. If you click on the manufacturer, then you'll see the specific model of phones. And if you select one, you enter the the the, 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 yeah, the name and then the MAC address. And of course, this is not going to let me continue, is it? Should be coming up shortly. Sorry about that. Uh, so for the SIP phones, if you don't see your particular model of phone or manufacturer there, then you're going to have to use uh, what's called a third third party setup. To do that, you would choose soft phone. You probably want to read the warning here. You would create the device name, and then you would click on create device. You would then use the SIP username, the SIP password, and then the account realm to program that third-party piece of software or uh, physical VoIP phone. Now, we do have some configuration outlines on our website for some devices, uh, but because of the sheer volume or sheer number of weight phones on the market, uh, we can't have guides for every model phone. Actually, we don't even have guides for every manufacturer out there just because there's so many manufacturers. All right, cell phone is pretty straightforward. Uh, you put in device name, and then you put plus one area code and phone number. And actually, we will I'm go to Duke here. Cause he... Now, once you've added them phone to the account, you've got some other options under advanced. So first one here that's by default unchecked, allow use of cell phone to voicemail. So when... Dash sends a call to a cell phone or a landline, and this applies to both. Uh, what happens is, again, a call gets sent out to that device. You pick up your cell phone. What you're first going to hear is the system message come on saying, this is a forwarded call. Please press 1. You press 1, you, then you're connected, and you can both talk to each other. Now, this is not always ideal for everybody. right? Some people just want to pick up their phone and just start talking. If you want that, you would then put a check mark here and then click on Save Changes. Here, we'll go ahead and do that now. So now what happens is when calls go to this particular cell phone device, you won't hear that this you'll hear this is a forwarded call, but you won't have to press one. It'll the call will be connected instantly after that, and then you can start talking. Downside of that is if you're using a cell phone your cell phone voicemail picks up, right, because you weren't able to answer the call, well, that inbound caller ends up on your personal cell phone's voicemail box. Now, if it's just a work cell phone, you probably don't care, and then you may actually prefer that, because then you can just grab the message off your cell phone and call the customer back. But if it's going to your own personal device, you may not want that. The other reason you would want to do this is if you're actually sending this call to, like, say, an automated answering service, right? Automated answering service can't press 1 to accept the call, so you don't want you would want this enabled, and that way it goes to the answering service, and then they handle the call from there. All right. Keep original caller ID. 
What that means is when the call gets sent to cell phone or landline with Keep Original Caller ID enabled, that inbound caller's phone number shows up as the caller ID on your device. Now, if you're sending it to your cell phone, maybe you want a way to know is this you know, a personal call or is this a work call? You could then uncheck this. And then what would happen instead is the, whatever phone number they called in on, so one of your, work, your company numbers, would show up as a caller ID. So that way on your cell phone, you know, oh, hey, this is a work call. Right off the bat, you can take it or not, depending on which you're in the middle of doing. And then hide from contact list. This basically sh so it doesn't show your cell phone number doesn't show up on the user directory. Uh, we alluded to this earlier, but soft phone. If you want to make use of the virtual PBX soft phone, we recommend that you do add it directly to the user. You would get, give it a device name, but right here. See, it says it's using third-party application. If you click on it, it'll change to use virtual PBX application. You notice a lot of that information disappears. You would then type in the device name and then click on Create Device. And then you would click on Save Changes. What that does is that the system will then create the credentials in the back end and send, in this case, Duke, an email with, hey, you've got a new soft phone. Here's your login. And it, uh, password to get into that cell phone application, and they just need to download the application onto their cell phone, for example. We do, oops, excuse me, uh, we do have a desktop version for Windows and Mac OS. Uh, however, there's a licensing fee associated with that. Its default is $39.99, I believe. Uh, so in that case, you would want to order the cell phone, and then we would create that for you. Uh, next up is a web phone. Again, a web phone, you need to set up directly on the user because it's tied with that user right off the bat. And again, you just put a device name and you click on create. And because uh, the web phone makes use of your dash login information to log into the web phone. Right. Currently, uh, web phone, actually, I know it works on Chrome, uh, yeah, on Chrome and Firefox. Although we did just release a new version not too long ago, so I need to double check what other browsers it is compatible with now. Uh, and we should have a user guide up on the web phone. But basically, initially the web, the web phone was basically just to make and receive calls, but now you can like transfer calls, put people on hold, etc. It's a lot more advanced usage. And yeah, all right. Landline is basically the same as a cell phone. Uh, the ATA and fax that you may have seen on there, I don't know of anyone who makes use of them, uh, but fax would be for a digital fax machine, so not set up to go on an analog phone line. Uh, again, I haven't seen any customer make use of those. Uh, and then ATA would be an ATA adapter, which basically use analog device and connect it to your network. You know, 10 years ago, that was fairly common because VoIP was still new and people weren't quite sure how much they trusted it. Nowadays, it's about the same price of, you know, an entry level VoIP phone is about the same price as an ATA adapter and it's one less point of failure. So we typically recommend just go straight to a VoIP phone, usually a bit easier to set up. All right, we're on the user features. All right, so the caller ID number, this only works if the user has a phone number. So you notice Duke has a 725 number, so this will work. You can turn it on and click on Save Changes. What this means is now whenever Duke makes an outbound call, his caller ID is going to be that 725 number instead of the default on the account. Call forwarding. So call forwarding is uh, for VoIP users, right? Basically, it's saying you're typically using a VoIP device. However, if something should go wrong with that VoIP device or you know you're going to be away from your desk, 
you can enable call forwarding. All right. So offer on that's kind of self explanatory. Basically, hey, I'm gonna be gone from my desk most of the day. Let me forward calls. You usually have an option for desk or mobile phone. And then you put in the plus one area code and phone number you're forwarding to. Whatever you're forwarding to should not be a device on the account or on the user specifically. So if I'm forwarding to my cell phone, that means my cell phone is not a device on my user. I just have my VoIP devices here. And then failover mode means the system will de you know, can get detect when a VoIP phone is not connected to us. So then it will automatically send callers to my forwarding device, my cell phone. Hot desking, this is also another VoIP uh, feature. You can enter in a hot desk ID. And say if you want to use a PIN, I usually just make it the same. And then you click on Save Changes. So what does hot desking do? Basically, this is if you have staff that are in a shared office environment where they will be at diff they can be at different desks, thus at different VoIP phones on a day-to-day -day basis. All right. So it's Tuesday. I'm at desk C and that you know phone C. I can then pick up that phone, use my hot desk ID and the PIN number to log into that phone. So that way when calls that are coming to my user will ring at the div that phone C that I'm sitting at. At the end of my shift, I log out of that phone. You know, Wednesday I come in going, all right, oh, not at desk C today. It looks like I'm over on desk M. I log into the phone at desk M. And then again, calls will come to me and I log out of it at the end of my shift. Voicemails, every user automatically has a voicemail box. And again, that's that one that's tied intrinsically with that user. Users can have their own fax box. Uh, we recommend that you have them have their own phone number for the fax box. So it goes directly to that phone number, directly to that user. You can technically set it up to go to an extension number. However, that means you have to essentially rely on the person faxing in to potentially change their habits. I'm old enough that for faxing, I go to a fax machine, you know, I hit scan, I enter the phone number, hit send fax, and I walk away. Because I just it'll get sent out. I'm not going to sit there and wait for it to confirm or not. I got other things to do with my time. If you're faxing to an extension on a user, what instead happens, you know, you call the number, then you have to enter that extension number, then you hit send fax. When you say that loud, it doesn't sound like that big a deal, but you have to get people to follow those steps, which they may not be used to, which is why I say if, they're, if you have users that have to have a fax box of their own, get them their own fax box number, so that way just enter a number, send the fax, they don't have to worry about it. Follow me. I don't know if this will work. Yeah, this doesn't. is not a good sample of that. Hatake has enough. So follow me works what is for when you have multiple devices on your account, on your user. Uh, by default, new devices are set up to do not ring. But once you uncheck that, here, actually here, we'll put this to default. So this is the, here, say changes. So then you want to uncheck your devices that you're going to use. Little green sh line shows up. Now, you can click distribute, for example, and it's automatically distributed. So it's going to ring this probably cell phone for 40 seconds. Then the next 40 seconds, it's going to ring this SIP phone, and then the last, this other SIP phone. You can click and drag these out. Or say, no, 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 I want this phone first, then that cell phone, then redistribute. And you can still, and you can even just do something like this, for example. That way all three phones are ringing for that full time. Uh, you notice that this is set to 120. That's based off of this number up here in this little box. You can always change that if you want. The one thing to keep in mind is 
especially for cell phones, you want to make sure it's at least 30 seconds, if not 45 to a minute, um, because it simply takes longer to route calls to a cell phone than it does to a VoIP phone or a landline. Music on hold, users can have their own hold music, and they can upload their file, .wav, .mp3, recorded in mono, up to one megabyte in size. Uh, just so you know, like a, a one megabyte MP3 is roughly five minutes long. So that's usually plenty of time for most instances. Uh, customized call recording. By default, all users are set to off. Uh, but if you want to record calls, you just can change them to on. Or you can choose to have some off. Something like that. So inbound internal means call coming to this user from another user on the account. All right. Inbound external means a call from a customer to this user. Right. So someone outside the system. All right. Outbound internal means hey call going from me to another user, and then outbound external from me to a customer. And then you click on save changes. All right, next up we've got groups, or shorthand for ring groups. Essentially, calls that are going to a department. Uh, ring groups have you know, a couple of different routing options, not a lot. So let's go ahead and add a group. You give it a name, you give it an extension number. And that's so your staff members, for, for instance, can transfer calls to the ring group. And then you click and drag the people that you want in that group. And then you click Create Group. Now if you click on the name here, you can change the name at any time. And then you've got dialing repeats. Basically, how many times can that inbound caller go through the, that group? One, two, you can keep setting up as high as you want. Then if you click on the members box, okay, this appears, your total ring duration. And then right now, like, oh, it's only going to ring for 20 seconds. I can click distribute here, just like I did under uh, follow me, and then I can set the order. I can change the order around, redistribute. All right, I can click and drag icons, or the, the lines here, so I have some overlap. Or I can set them all so that they're all again the entire time. And then click Save Changes. Now, one thing to keep in mind is if we bring up the group's names here, say if Bob's on a call and another call comes into this group, he's still going to get a call waiting beep, letting him know, hey, a call's coming in, until one of the other people in the group picks up a call. So that's one thing to keep in mind. And that's uh, the other thing is that the staff members can't log themselves in and out of the group or you know set themselves to a way. Right? If they're in the group, they're in the group. And as long as they're, you have open hours that can route calls to it, their phones will ring. Uh, just like users, groups can have multiple extension numbers. You can set up a phone number that goes directly into a group versus having to go through the menu options. And then groups also have features. All right. So first up, call recording. If you enable it, just remember, you have, to, you, you have to pay attention to local laws, and that's your responsibility. But basically, if you turn call recording, it's on for everyone, right? It's just inbound calls to the group recorded. Bring back. This is essentially hold music for the group, i.e., uh, what does your customer hear as they're waiting for one of your staff members to pick up the call? You can, and again, you can upload a file, .mp3, .wave, in mono, 
up to one megabyte, uh, or you can choose a file that you already have. The main thing to remember is that you want that the ringback duration to match the the ring time out of the group, right? So 120 seconds, I want to make sure that whole music file, the ringback music file is at least 120 seconds. They're not going to hear the whole thing, hopefully, because my staff members will pick up the call before that, but at least they have something to listen to. Next action, basically, if no one picks up after those two ring throughs, what do you want the system to do with that caller? So if no one answers for the call to the main menu, i.e. the virtual receptionist, I can send them to a voicemail box, and you can also send them to a user. And it looks like you can also send them or to a specific device. I usually recommend either a user or a voicemail box. Allow call forward. Again, this is for your VoIP phone users. If you enable this, what you're letting them do is if your staff members are going to be away from their physical desk phones, they can still have group calls go to their cell phone or their landline, for example. And then the next feature is caller ID prepend. Again, this is a VoIP phone feature, but what this allows you to do is to set additional either text or numeric prefix to the caller ID information that will show up on the, the VoIP phone's screen, i.e., this lets your staff member know, oh, this is about the Labor Day group versus their, if they're normally in the support group, for example. All right, devices basically shows you your devices on the account. You can always add the same op device options here. Uh, and the reason you would do just add devices from here is if, like, your IT person has set up a new office location, they don't know where people are sitting. They may not even know all the people who are going to be at the new location. So they can just, like, you know what, I'm going to add all these devices here. And then once the users or once the people are at the office, they, you know, assign them to the specific user and then they're good to go. Voicemail boxes. Uh, so every user that's created automatically has a voicemail box. Uh, but you can manually create a voicemail box, and the reason you would do that is for like that uh, ring group we just set up. So. I forgot the numbers have to have four digits. So you notice here it's not associated with any particular person. So that's how you know it's a manually created voicemail box. Uh, when it comes to deleting voicemail boxes, again, you want to avoid deleting the voicemail box for a user, if at all possible, uh, mostly because if you try to recreate it, you can't assign it to a particular user. So when you create a voicemail box, you're going to want to give it some sort of greeting file. You can either choose from one that's already selected or you can upload a new file. Uh, recipients. Basically, you can add the email addresses of the people that you want to get the voicemails for this voicemail box. So like for the Labor Day group here, uh, you would probably want to put like the manager's email address because if he suddenly gets a lot of voicemail boxes, he or she can say, hey, what's going on with my staff? Why aren't, you know, are we so busy that we need to add more people to the group, for example? Or is there a technical problem so people's, you know, phones aren't working properly or what? You know, or did, like, everyone, like, take lunch and break at the same time without checking with each other? The whatever, Right. And then you can have multiple people as well. 
uh, and then the options. So once you have a media file uh, uploaded, you would just, you would click already set up. Uh, and then the other option here for any voicemail box, whether it's manual created or created for a user, you have the option here for delete after notification. So by default, the system sends you an email saying, hey, you've got a voicemail. Now, if you click delete after notification, what that means is after that email is sent out, the voicemail in the voicemail box is deleted, basically saving space, because each voicemail box can hold up to 100 messages. And after it gets to that 100 messages, it says the mailbox is full and you're not allowed to leave a message. So if you have delete after notifications, you don't have to worry about that ever happening. Purely up to you. And again, click on save changes. All right. Next up is feature codes. These are for VoIP phones. Uh, and these are the various options. These are all also published on our website uh, under dash support feature codes. Uh, so basically, Again, how to log in to their, the call center or ACD queues if they're in the queues. Uh, enable call forwarding from their phone, hot desking, etc. Next up, we've got call logs. And I don't know if we have any that show up in here. Oh, hey, we do. Basically, this shows all the call activity on the account. It gives you an idea of what happened or how long the calls lasted. You can click on a call, get a better idea of what what well, what may have been going on. The little gear icon is for technical details, which may or may not be that helpful. Uh, basically depends on how well you can read this. For me, unfortunately, I don't know the ins and outs of all of this, so I couldn't tell you if there's anything special that happened here, other than it looked like it did try to call, and then afterward the call ended. But basically, if you see normal clearing on a call, that means as far as the system is concerned, the call ended normally. It's if something else shows up here that you're like, wait, what happened? And then you can probably have to call support and say, hey, I got this weird message on a call log. I'm not sure what that means. And then we can take a look. Usually that means we have to make test calls to see if we can recreate the issue. All right, let's get back into here. Let's go over into call queues. If you're gonna make use of ACD queues, uh, one thing to keep in mind is uh, queues are $30 per month per ACD queue. You can always, you know, click add a new queue. Once a queue is created, you can go into here to click on the settings. And these are the same settings you would set up under adding a new queue. So queue name, give it a name. You can give it a call-in number or an extension. Routing strategy, you've got a couple options. Oh, they're not showing up. Of course, they're not going to. There's four call routing options for an ACD queue. Uh, first is round robin, which is essentially random that evens out over time. Um, there is most calls, meaning most connected calls. So, Mary has, or sorry, least calls, excuse me. So, Mary uh, has talked to five people, Bob's only talked to three. The next call that comes in is going to Bob, and we'll continue going to Bob until he equals Mary's number of connected calls. Now, obviously, if Bob's on a call and a second call comes in, Mary's going to get that second call. All right. uh, then there's least offered. So say, for instance, Bob's been offered 20 calls. Mary's only been offered 10. Mary's going to get the next call that comes in because she hasn't had as many calls offered to her as Bob. And then the last option, which is the one showing up here, is most idle. Basically, who's been waiting around for the call the longest? We get the call that comes in. Uh, what advantage of queues also is that your agents can log in and out of the queue. They can also mark themselves as un uh, unavailable, meaning they're away from their, their desk. Uh, you've got options for hold music. You can, again, upload a file, .wav, .mp3, one megabyte in mono. Q timeout, basically how much time people can hold, stay on hold. Measure 10 seconds. Q call limit, zero means that there's no limit, but then you otherwise you would set how many people can wait on hold. All right, so she said it's five. Only five people can wait on hold on top of whoever's talking to somebody. If you have no agents logged in, you can say, hey, we're just gonna timeout immediately 
right, by clicking this to enable. And if the timeout happens immediately or uh, someone's been waiting on hold for the 3,600 seconds, well, then you've got these two options come into play. Either you can escalate it to another queue, so that means you have a second ACD queue, so another $30. Or if you set this at none, then you can set it, hey, let's go set it to a voicemail. I think you can send it to a user as well. Oh, maybe not. Just yeah, just a voicemail box. All right, over here, agent recovery time. Basically, after an agent has spoken to a customer, the call ends. How much time in seconds do they have to like catch their breath, get a drink of water, etc.? Uh, force away on rejected or missed call. If this is enabled. Basically, your agent misses a call. The system automatically puts them in away mode until that agent manually puts themselves back into available. I imagine that mostly this would be like a, a sales kind of queue or anyone commission-based because they're going to want to take calls as much as possible. Uh, and then agent connect timeout, basically how much time does the system try to ring a particular agent before moving on to the next agent? And then you would click on Save Changes. Oh, yeah. And so for any of your staff members that are in ACD queues, they will have a queue option to get into. And then this is actually the queue monitor page. Um, so we can go to this one because someone's actually logged into it, apparently. So you see this agent is logged in and waiting to take a call. And you know that they're waiting to take a call because this icon here or this line is green. Uh, if it's blue, that means they're on a call. And they'll actually say on a call and give you a time of how long they've been on the call. Uh, let's see, it's red means they've marked themselves away. There's a yellow means they're on an outbound call. And then gold is that they're on the recovery timer. All right, blacklists. Again, this is for blocking of calls. You would click edit blacklist. You would click on the list you want or create a new one if you haven't, or click Add to create one if you haven't. You give it a name. Uh, block Anonymous means if there's no valid caller ID, if you turn this on, that means you're blocking the call, right? Otherwise, you can turn it off. And then you put plus one area code and phone number for any phone number that you don't want to connect to your system. And then you click Save. You go back to Settings. And then you move that setting over or that list over into selected, and then you click update. Now, once you do that, those numbers are then blocked from reaching the system. And I'm just moving it back just for simplicity's sake. As I mentioned before, faxes as an admin, you can get to any fax box on the system and see any faxes that they have. Uh, you can also see the email to fax logs, which you see here. Oh, thumbs down. That's bad. You click on here and, oh, you say fax box number is empty. So basically what this is telling me, I have a problem with my fax box that I need to get adjusted to be able to send out faxes. I showed you the user port. Oh, and the voicemail. This is the voicemail manager, and again, you get any voicemails on the account. I don't think there's any. Um, and basically, recordings gets me to a different website. It let me see if it takes us there or not. Yeah, it looks like it's not going to let me go there. Uh, basically, uh, the recordings are hosted by uh, Amazon Web Services. It just uses your dash login information. You can then listen to your recordings and download them or delete them. Uh, that's something, if you're making use of call recordings, you're going to want to manage fairly regularly uh, because, unfortunately, right now, you can only delete them one at a time. Uh, and that's about it. Uh, web hooks, again, if you're, you're making use of APIs, um, unfortunately, that means you have to be able to program, which is not something I can do, so I can't really get into that. But that is Dash Training. So I thank you for your time today. I didn't see any questions pop up in chat. So unless anyone does have a question, feel free to make use of chat here on 
on YouTube, and I can answer them or show you the relevant answer. But other than that, thank you for your time, and have a wonderful day.